1 Corinthians chapter 1, as we're, uh, we're going to read some, some verses here, and we're going to turn quite a bit, so hopefully you have your turning fingers and your old Bible with you tonight, and uh, we're going to look at some verses here, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, we'll begin reading in verse number 18, verse number 18, the Bible says this, for the preaching of the cross uh, is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made himself, uh, hath not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, and a stumbling black block unto the Greeks in foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and the things which are despised, God hath chosen Yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bow before you this evening. Again, we ask you if you would, uh, Father, be in our midst, be with those we've mentioned uh, in our prayer, prayer list, or prayer petition, and Father, be with the hearts of those that have come out. And uh, Father, we want to pray for those that want to be here that are not able to. And Father, we uh, ask that you would be with the message, fill me with your Holy Spirit. And Father, uh, we pray that the, the word goes into the hearts and the hears, and Father, suits a blessing, plants a seed, encourages uh, one another, and Father, straightens our, our crooked paths. And we're thankful, Father, uh, for this evening to have this time and opportunity to worship you uh, in, in, here and at the church, and uh, we're thankful for that. Be with us as we move forward, and we ask all this in Jesus Christ's name we ask, amen. amen. This evening here, if you look at verse, uh, verse 30 is what I'm going to key in on. We're going to look at four things that are mentioned in this verse. It says in verse 30, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And so you say, well, why do we read the other verses? There's a context here uh, where you see a contrast, and you see the contrast in the Bible quite often. A contrast, uh, positive or negative, uh, good or evil or bad, uh, light versus darkness, wrong and right. You see a lot of contrasting in scriptures. One of the things that is sadly missing uh, in, in the world today is the contrast. They don't want contrast. They want everything to come together. And uh, sad, that, that is just isn't the case that as you study and look at this, especially in Scripture, and we're looking at Scripture tonight, but you notice in our earlier readings in verse 18 on down, he speaks of the foolishness, uh, and he says that, he says for verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. And so we see that God chose the foolishness of preaching to save those that are lost. The world recognizes it, even, even those listening recognize preaching as foolishness. When you hear somebody proclaim the word of God, one of the first things that you, you'll get if you take a, a census is that it's foolishness. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It's, there's no real continuity to it, although we'll have an outline or some things written down or maybe just get up and uh, as the Holy Spirit leads you. But here we notice that the, the world views preaching as foolishness. 
And he says in verse 20, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? There's three classes of different types of people, and he brings it out. And he wants to know, he's asked this question to each one of them. Where's the wise? Where's the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? And you see that it says here in verse 21, for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. And it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And then uh, something on a sidebar, I always try to give a little sidebar for the Bible student. Look at verse 22, it says, for the Jews require, uh, the Jews require a sign. A lot of your new versions will change this word here to demand. And so you say, well, what's the difference with that? What happens is you change the definition or the meaning, and it breaks up the continuity of other scriptures in your Bible. And so there it speaks of the Jews requiring the sign. A lot of times people get, uh, they get a little confused, maybe more than a little confused, uh, in the sign gifts. And the Apostle Paul here in this writing, later on in this, this very epistle, about chapter 13 and chapter 14, he lays out the gifts and what they are. And he lays out the gifts for the church. And uh, here they were confused in this. They were wrongly using these gifts. And one of the things that they were messed up in is that the Jews required a sign. And that, that goes along with the Old Testament scriptures all the way through. And you want to keep that continuity. Here's what I'm saying tonight. If you have a Bible that does not have require in it, you want to get you a new Bible. Uh, the, the word, these words are very important. Let's move on down. Verse 25, notice the contrast again. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So the contrast here uh, for verse 26, for you see your calling, brethren, that uh, how that not many wise men after the flesh are not many mighty, not many noble. So he's contrasting, look, there's not many uh, wise men that are called. And so you say, well, why is that? Well, it, he gets down into her and he, he speaks of the glory that man wants. Man, by natural, uh, by default, is a glory robber from God. Uh, man wants that praise and that glory, and he says here, that's why not many wise men are called after the flesh, not many noble or mighty are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things which are mighty. If you find yourself in, in a Bible-believing church and you have great contrast or confliction, against what is being preached or taught because, man, it just seems simple, it seems plain, or this is the same old thing. Uh, it just it could have a little more polish to it or something like that. Be careful because this is contrary to what God is saying. You should put two words together and make some sense, and you should have some thought and some, some basic teaching and preaching about you, but there's not going to be very, very much eloquence come from, and this is what Paul was dealing with with the Corinthian church. He didn't come to him with uh, very big words, flamboyant words. He come, come to him with uh, very base words, very basic things, and this is how he addressed him. You say, why is he bringing this up? If you read before this chapter, the church was dealing with different factions. Today, we would call it cliques in the church. A uh, group over here was following uh, Peter. A group over here was, a, was following Apollos. A group over here was following Paul. And so they were broken up, and they were saying, well, I was baptized of this, or I like that person. And so there was, there was different cliques or factions in the church, and he was breaking that down. And they were getting glory out of who was the better person or not. In verse 29, as we approach the verse we're going to look at tonight, that no flesh should glory in his presence. And so... God hath chosen this way. That's why God also had chosen the church. When, when, when you have a Christian or you have somebody that walks contrary to the things that the church is doing, and I'm speaking of a good biblical New Testament church, you're, you've got issues. The person has a heart problem. Something isn't right. And so God instituted the church. He provisioned the church. He commissioned the church. And so when you say, well, I don't need the church. I don't need nothing to do with it. You've, there's, there's an issue. There's a heart issue there. Here, when you're dealing with people and men, you got a problem with, well, it's got to be said a certain way, it's got to be done this way and that. God didn't choose that method or that way. And you see that in the world and Christendom today. Everything is polished, spit, shined, and uh, put, put down just right. And it, it more or less tickles your ears. It makes you feel good. And that's not what God chose. He chose the foolishness of preaching uh, to save 
the lost, to confound the wise, is what Scripture here is saying. Verse 30, let's, let's get into this. But of, him are, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus. And he makes this point and he summarizes, I think, what he's saying in the, in the chapter, who of God is made unto us. Now watch what is given to us. We're made in Christ, but there's something that is bestowed to us. It's here, and he gives it in four parts. He says, wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And he says, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. This, this wisdom, this righteousness, this sanctification, uh, this redemption comes from God. This is where we need to key in, and this is what we're going to look at tonight. Let's get ready to turn. Let's look at the first one, wisdom. Now, wisdom, if we're there in Corinthians, so let's start in Corinthians. Move over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we're going to develop this wisdom. And what does the Bible have to say about this particular wisdom? 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I want verse 6, and it says this, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now this context, again, you're dealing with the second epistle, but he's dealing with the same thing. And watch this, verse 5, let's back up and watch the context, for we preach not ourselves. This is kind of what I was saying in our introduction, is we shouldn't preach ourselves. Uh, and what that's meant by that is you should preach the Word of God. Everything that you should say or do from the pulpit, teaching, preaching, whatever it may, even your witness, even your daily life, should come from the Word of God. And so it's, there's, you say, well, where's that line at? Listen, if you're listening to a man uh, that doesn't follow the, the Word of God, preach from the Word of God, or teach from the Word of God, and he's got a philosophy, he's got something somewhere else, you've got problems. It's going to begin to fall apart. You say, why? It's because the Spirit of God doesn't work with, with those other methods. It works with the Word of God. That's the key to success. So we watch this verse 5, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So when you get saved, those that are saved have a knowledge. It's given to everyone. You've heard me say this, and I've even taught on it all maybe a couple years ago, the doctrine of illumination. It's the big word that the Bible uses that everyone that gets saved is illuminated spiritually. Uh, not There isn't a person that isn't born again spiritually that the light doesn't come on. Now, I'm not talking about that the light doesn't come on and all of a sudden they they know everything about the Bible. They know everything that they should do and shouldn't do. And they're a perfect type Christian. <laughs> There's a growth period. But God, through the Holy Spirit, the working and the power of the Holy Spirit, turns your spiritual light on and the knowledge of God begins, begins to filter in through the Word of God. And this is the wisdom that he's speaking of here. It comes from God. It's made in God, in Christ, he says. So let's look at another verse. We're in Corinthians. Let's move to the right. Ephesians chapter 1. Notice this verse. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17 and 18, it says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, there's part of the doctrine we just mentioned, that ye may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So here we're, we're seeing another verse that correlates or moves with the wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Christ. Ephesians chapter 1. Look at Ephesians chapter 3 right across the way. Notice with me 9 and 10. And it says this, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Now verse 10, uh, I'm sorry, verse 8, unto me whom am less than the least of all saints in this grace, giving that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And verse 9, watch verse 10, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. You see, I, I like uh, what Brother Sam Gipp said one time. He said, God didn't give this, this word or the Bible to academia to keep. 
He gave it to the church to keep. And uh, you see churches as a whole, they've, they've dumbed down. They've dumbed down. If you study church history and you go back, uh, man, they, we've definitely dumbed down. We've stepped away from doctrine. We stepped away from the principles of the Word of God. And we stepped away from the precepts and laws of this Bible. And you say, why? It's because it, 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 it sounds more pleasant to the ear. There's more glory given to man than to God. And you say, well, what are we saying here? Well, wisdom, this wisdom that we need, that we should use every day, is going to come from God. And it's given to the church and the people of God. The church is the people of God. And so we, we see that this intent, this manifold wisdom is of God, and it's from God. Now, we're in Ephesians. Let's move one over, and we'll move to our second point. Let's look at Colossians to look at this wisdom again. Turn with me to Colossians, and I believe I want chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verse 2, that their heart might be comforted, being knitted together in love, unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding. Watches to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. Now notice with me verse number 3, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So this has a pattern. We're developing a pattern with these verses. Same context, as a matter of fact, same writer, uh, dealing with a different church. But notice with me, let's move. We're, we're right there in Colossians. Look at chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let the, word of God, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And so we see that this wisdom comes from God. We're to use this wisdom to give God glory in our lives. So back in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're looking at these four, uh, four if you please, principles that God lays out here. Uh, and so we see here that wisdom, I'm back in our text, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom. So we see this wisdom is to be used. See, while I'm not a very bright person, uh, I have and I struggle with uh, retaining wisdom. Well, this wisdom from God is not retained in our own power. It's retained by the Holy Spirit in you. And so it, you say, wow, that's, that's why you'll have, you'll have an individual who doesn't get solid on salvation or uh, the everla everlasting life. They begin to sway with this. And they don't understand that the salvation, this wisdom, this redemption... The sanctification is in Christ. It's held by the power of God, by the power of Christ. This wisdom is the same thing. And so you say, well, I don't want it. Well, you can refuse it. You have that for sure. And we begin to grieve or quench the Holy Spirit. We don't want to do that. And so we're looking at this wisdom. Let's look at the next one here. He mentions in our text righteousness. So not only wisdom, but he looks at righteousness. And I begin to think of Romans chapter 1. So, like I said, we're going, to, we're going to turn quite a bit here, but I want to really notice these verses. Romans chapter 1, notice with me in verse number 17. We're looking at righteousness now. This is also made up, uh, we're made up in His righteousness, which is by Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul doctrinally is averting their attention from men to God or to Christ. And that's why he even says, look, all I care to know about you, and I'm kind of paraphrasing the verse, it's about you or among you is save Jesus Christ and him crucified. They were getting caught up, these people in this church, with the carnal church was getting caught up in everything else other than what they really should be, and it was Jesus Christ and him crucified. You know, this week, before we read verse 17 here in Romans chapter 1, I watched part of an interview by Paul Harvey, and he was interviewing Billy Sunday. It was an interview probably, I would say, maybe somewhere around the early or late 70s. And he began to get into how he began his ministry. One of the things that really struck me in that conversation that they had, and they had a kind of relaxed setting at Billy, or Billy not Billy Sunday, I'm sorry. Um, who am I trying to say here? Billy Billy Graham, there you go, thank you. Billy Sunday is a, quite a bit older. He's done and gone on with, to be with the Lord, and so is Billy Graham. But Billy Graham is who Paul Harvey was interviewing. I'll get it right here. They had a relaxed setting, and it was in Billy Graham's house. And he had asked him, he says, what, how did you, with all the press 
and all the, the coverage that you were getting from these revivals and evangelistic outreaches and the preaching, how did you stay focused? And he said, I, I early began to pray and fast that God would center me. And he said, I could have easily gone off into doctrines. I could have easily got off into different things that was going on in Christendom that, of that day. But he said, God began to burden my heart and to center me on Jesus Christ and Him crucified, plus or minus nothing. And he said, I focused on that. I could, And he said, there was many times that I could have strayed from that. And he said, there's good men of God that have and have to stand up for that. But he said, my, it seems like God had, had uh, convicted me, burdened me to stay focused on the cross and Jesus Christ. And he had an effective ministry. I'm not propping him up, but that's what he was doing. And if you go back and listen and watch him preach, God definitely used that man. And so uh, as a younger man looking back, I think, wow, that's amazing. He could have got caught up. And we oftentimes get caught up in many different things than other what we should be concentrated on. And that's Jesus Christ and him crucified. So Paul, back to my point, Paul is refocusing this church or trying to uh, saying, look, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, all this is in Christ. This is where you need to lie. This is where you need to focus on. Get off of these men, get off the hobby horses, and let's move on with what we're supposed to do as a church. And so here, Romans chapter 1, verse 17, we're going to look at righteousness. He says, for therein is righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Quoting an old verse, we're in Romans. Notice with me now, we're going to move in Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, verses 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Watch how he develops this. We'll read on to verse 24. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Again, the Apostle Paul here in Romans was dealing with the Jew and Gentile. They were arguing. The Jews wanted some of that law back into the church. And Paul was trying to say, look, there is no difference between the Jew and Gentile. There's one body, and this is what he's laying out. He said, this is by Jesus Christ. This righteousness is not obtained by the law. Oh, so we see, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Conclusion, verse 24, being justified freely by grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You see, what are you saying? The, the righteousness that you and I enjoy based off our salvation is in Christ Jesus. It's not a co-redeemership. It's not a partnership. It's something that you and I enjoy by the declaration of God found in the work in Christ Jesus. That work is the cross, the death, the burial, and resurrection. You say, well, that needs to be pointed. That's very important because your salvation, that's where your salvation ends. You know, you get those days where you just have a bad day. And then, you know what pops into that day, especially if you haven't been reading your Bible, praying, witnessing, doing the things that you know you should as a Christian, you begin to wonder about that salvation. Man, you know, if it was conditional on what I was doing or not doing, I would not have salvation right now. And you begin to doubt your salvation. Well, you say, where does that come from? That comes from our human nature. That comes, of course, from Satan, the, the second enemy that we have. And in this world, it'll drag you down to that point where you think you're not saved as a Christian. You say, what do you rest in? What do you put your assurance in? The righteousness, the righteousness that you and I have as saved is God's. It's God's righteousness. He keeps that. If he's having a bad day, like I've said, if he's not feeling too well, if you don't think he can uh, make it through, then we got a problem. But God says, no, I'm the same today and forever and ever will be. I'm the Alpha and Omega. And he says here, this righteousness is, is in God. We're wrapped up in this. And he was trying to get this through uh, these people's saved hearts, carnal but yet saved. He called them the beloved here in 1 Corinthians. But let's move on. We're in Romans. Notice with me now Romans chapter 4. We're going to continue on with this righteousness. Romans chapter 4. Notice with me verse 6. He says here, Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. So when you begin to hear somebody teach a works-based salvation, or we can... We can, we can put it down in biblical terms, work, work, 
works-based righteousness, you've got a problem because there's something that is not understood. And right here is one of the verses. David, even of old, knew that. David, King David had committed a sin, more than one sin, that was guilty of death. There wasn't a sacrifice that David could bring into the temple when he had committed adultery or murder. It would, there was, there's no sacrifice for that. You were to be stoned. And he's, this is what he was writing here and quoting here, even as David also described it, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputed the righteousness without works. There was nothing in the law that could save David. He was condemned according to the own law that he believed in. But God, which is rich in mercy, was able to extend him, not impute that, that sin without works. You think, how is that? That's doable through Christ, only through Christ, not through us. All right, we need to grasp this. Let's move on here. Now look at verse 25 in that same chapter. We're going to see verse 25. Who was delivered for our, for our offenses, who was raised again for our justification. If you read this, this is a rich chapter. If you read this, this is very important to catch it. It gives you the nuggets that you need for your salvation, to have assurance of your salvation. We're in Romans. Turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. We want verses 19 and 20, 21. He says here, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners. This is Adam, speaking of Adam. So by the obedience of one, that is Christ, shall many be made righteous. How is that done? Through the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now watch verse 21. Uh, he says, verse 20, Moreover the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Now watch this, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto, what? Eternal life. By How is this done? By Jesus Christ our Lord. This is in Christ. This is what 1 Corinthians chapter 1, this is what Paul's describing to these people. Look, your righteousness is in Christ, in Christ Jesus. Let's go back to Corinthians. And I don't think I'm going to get through all four of these tonight, but that's all right. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is important to get, to get these verses down. If you're taking notes or jotting them down, these are good verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, notice with me. In the right place here, verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in, not ourselves, in him, in Jesus Christ. So when you begin to look at the righteousness that you and I enjoy as saved people, it's in Christ Jesus. So that's why when we look at somebody who says, oh, I can make my own righteousness. He said, there's a righteousness, there's a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And man goeth about to establish his own righteousness. No matter how puny our righteousness would be up against Jesus Christ, that'd be pretty puny. Do you, we, we realize that there's people dying and going to hell uh, that will be at the judgment seat that are going with their own righteousness. And I, I would say almost 100% of them are all religious their own righteousness. Uh, the Bible speaks of that as Cain's way, a righteousness. It's in Christ, according to these verses that were. We got one more. Move with me to Philippians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness. Wow, so there is a righteousness you can, you can omit, uh, develop which is of the law, there you go, it's law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by, by faith, not by the law, not by works. You see, the, the law institutes works. It'll have a works-based type. Either you do or you don't do. You say, well, what good is that? Well, it's good for a schoolmaster. It, it tells you where you've come short uh, and where, where you need to be, but it it doesn't have a righteousness unto itself, not like what God can give us, not something that gives you eternal life. All right, that's why that high priest had to continually, year by year, go in and, and, and shed that blood, have that blood. You say, why? Well, that's what took place on the cross. Christ did it once. 
His blood was eternal. He was able to do that one time. It's over. It concluded that. And it done away with what we call the Old Testament. And so we have a New Testament, the death of the testator is what the Bible says. So let's move into sanctification. I'm watching the clock. I've got a few more minutes here. So we're looking at this verse in 1 Corinthians. And I'll try to run back over there if I can find it. <laughs> 1 Corinthians. Ro uh, I'm, yep, 1 Corinthians. I'm in Romans. That's not going to do me any good. 1 Corinthians chapter 30, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification. All right, so let's get into the sanctification and we'll, we'll, we'll land this thing. Turn with me to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. See, why are you turning these, these, these verses? It's important. You're not going to get... The Bible student needs to, to compare Scripture with Scripture, that's what the Bible says. So we're gonna, that's what we're doing tonight. For John, St. John chapter 17, notice with me now under sanctification. John chapter 17, verse 17, and he says this, He says, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth, as thou hast sent me into the world. This is the, this is the prayer of Christ. This is uh, Christ's prayer. Uh, he says, as thou hast sent me into the world, even as I have also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified. Now watch, through the truth. So there is a way or a method to be sanctified. Now when we get saved, you and I, there is a spiritual sanctification. God or Christ sets you, the Holy Spirit does it, apart he detaches you from your flesh, according to Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. You've seen the diagram that we draw. You see the verses that we make. So the Holy Spirit cuts you away, cuts away, and He sets you apart. He sanctifies your soul and your spirit. So when you, when you die, your soul and your spirit go to heaven, and your body goes into the ground, all right? Now, if you're lost in that condition, your soul and your spirit don't go to heaven. It goes to hell, a holding place. And that's where it says your flesh still goes into the ground. You say, How do you know that? Well, you dig them up here. Their body's still there. Bones, whatever else is there. Their body's here. Now one day, and get this, at the day of redemption, that's as good as your redemption goes to that day. Your redemption there. And at that day, your trend, he changes you. He gives you a new body. Uh, a new life, and, and he resurrects that old body, changing it. I don't care if it's burnt, mutilated, in the water, in the sea. It doesn't matter where it's at. God made all the molecules. He, he, he puts you back together. Amen. And he'll give you a new, he'll glorify. It's a glorified body. So that's what takes place. But So you have a spiritual sanctification, but you have a physical sanctification. Now watch this, Acts chapter 26. Watch as this develops. I'm going to wind this down because I'm out of time. But watch this, Acts 26, when with this verse. I've got, I got to keep turning here. Chapter 26, verse 18, notice this. He says, to open their eyes. Okay, we're kind of catching this in the middle of the chapter. He says, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified. What? By, there it is again, the mode, by faith that is in me. So you see Paul was preaching here and he's describing uh, this and he's preaching this and he's talking about the change or transformation. Again, the, the doctrine of illumination comes here. The darkness into light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive for them uh, forgiveness of sins. That's what you and I have enjoyed. An inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith. That is in me. And so you see his gospel, that's what we enjoy. We've been given so much as a child of God in this age. And we're looking through the wisdom that is given to us by God. Uh, we're looking at the righteousness that you and I enjoy, and it's part of our salvation. And we're looking at the sanctification. I will end there this evening. You say, why, why, why are we looking at this? Well, there's four simple things that we and I should be, fo you and I should be focused on rather than who we're following, what's going on in the world, because there's a lot going on. A lot of, lot of stuff going on right now. So what should we be centered and focused on? The wisdom of God. We should be centered on and focused on the righteousness of God that you and I enjoy no matter what happens. Where we end up, what takes place, good or bad. And then we have ended here looking at sanctification. We'll pick this back up uh, at our next time. But let's all stand to be an encouragement, to stay focused. What? On the things of God, not on the things of man. So easy, we live in a, in a fleshly world, a man's world, you might say. 
And uh, we, we get sidetracked. I know I do get sidetracked. But tonight, we can center on the wisdom, the righteousness of God. Pastor, you Page got a song 271. Here? 271. Lord, I'm coming home. 271. Let's sing a, a verse or two.